Welcome back to Trendlines Over Headlines, the show where we break down the markets with some of the best traders and analysts out there. My name is Patrick Dunawell and I'll be your host. Our guest today is David Keller. David is the Chief Market Strategist over at Stock Charts. He's a highly respected technician and he's someone I consider to be an expert in behavioral finance. Prior to working at Stock Charts, David was a Managing Director of Research at Fidelity, where he ran their legendary chart room. It's going to be a great conversation, but before we talk to David, it's Friday, the markets are closed, so let's take a quick look at how this week played out. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Just a quick reminder, be sure to click like and subscribe so we can continue bringing you awesome content. Thanks. All right, so stocks took a bit of a pause this week, but nothing too damaging. The Dow led, but it was essentially flat on the week. The Russell 2000 lagged, falling a little more than 1.5%. Now, taking a closer look at the S&P 500, we kind of just chopped around all week. We haven't had a 1% move in six days now which is a real change of character from what we've seen this year. We still have yet to break above the 200-day moving average and that downtrend line that's been in place for most of this year. So that's really the next upside objective here. Call it around 4,100. Also, it's pretty important that we hold above those October highs around 3,900 next week. If we can't hold above those October highs, we could have another nasty fail breakout on our hands. So definitely keep an eye on that 3,900 level next week. Now, taking a closer look at the sector performance, only three of the 11 sectors closed higher this week. Defensive sectors like staples and utilities led, gaining a little more than 1%. On the other hand, consumer discretionary lagged, falling nearly 3% on the week. Anyways, that's enough for me. Let's welcome David onto the show. All right, David, welcome to the show and thanks for joining us today. Yeah, Patrick, good to be with you, man. Yeah, listen, you're more of a pro at hosting these shows than I am. Uh, you know, for our viewers that don't know, you have a great show on YouTube and, and on stock charts called The Final Bar, and you have some great guests on there. Uh, and, you know, I thought doing a weekly show was challenging, but you do it daily. Uh, isn't that right? Yeah, every day, and I do a closing bell show, and it, it is in some ways a little overwhelming, but... As you've probably found when you do a show regularly, so for me doing it every day, it's now become part of my process. So the days when I take a day off from the show, like I will for for Thanksgiving next week, it puts me off a little bit. I feel like I have a little less connection to the market. So now it's just kind of become part of my normal routine, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I feel the same way about the chart report. Like, you know, it, it is tough. It was tougher at first to do it every day, but now I can't imagine uh, going a day without it because it kind of helps you with your own process and keeping your pulse on the market, um, or your, your fingers on the market's pulse, anyway. Um, I want to get your thoughts on the current market environment, but first, I got to ask you, you know, you used to work in that legendary chart room at Fidelity, so tell us a little bit more about it. What was it like? Is the chart room as cool as it sounds, or what? <laughs> So if you are into market history and investor sentiment and technical analysis, it is a pretty fabulous place. Uh, Walter Diemer, who ran the technical research team at Putnam in the 70s and, and still is you know, on, uh, on social media pretty actively, he called it the cathedral of charts. Uh, <laughs> and, and he's right. I mean, it was such a, it was a great, restful, mindful place to sort of learn the lessons of market history. Um, a physical location dedicated to, uh, you know, understanding market dynamics and really visually analyzing market trends. Uh, and and part of it, I think the big benefit of it was it was uh, still uh, when I was there, I left uh, Fidelity in 2016, still wall sized paper charts that dominated the room. Now, we'd added some really cool digital, uh, you know, screens. We'd added a 13 foot plasma screen and other really cool stuff. But at the end of the day, telling the story of the U.S. equity markets on a you know couple hundred year chart in a big long term trend, it just told you a lot of what you needed to know about the overall trajectory of the market. So some of my favorite memories uh, debating market strength and weakness, debating uh, ideas happened in the chart room. So I uh, I, uh, I certainly uh, I certainly appreciated the time there. Now, is it still around today? 
It is. So uh, Fidelity has a good team of technical analysts. Uh, Mark Dibble is the most senior analyst. He started in the industry in 1982. So he's pretty well seasoned and and knows uh, knows technical analysis very well. Darren Chabot, Patrick Torbert, um, Roy Justice. There's a really good group of analysts there. And uh, yeah, still working with the equity portfolio managers and using the chart room really to tell the story of technical analysis to all of Fidelity's clients, which is a really good and uh, important role. And whose idea was the chart room? Because I, I think I remember hearing that the founder of Fidelity was was kind of a fan of technicals and, and charts, right? So Edward Johnson II was sort of the founder of Fidelity. He was a lawyer in town in Boston and uh, bought the Fidelity Fund, bought into the Fidelity Fund and then relaunched it and uh, built it into Fidelity, which is, I mean, just a, a huge operation with the brokerage side, all sorts of different capital markets and everything along with asset management. Uh, but the idea with the chart room, I mean, back in the 1950s and 60s, charting was a very manual process. So Ralph Acampora, who you and I both have gotten to know over time, you know, he he used to call himself a chartist because 90% of his time was spent creating the charts. Like the analysis was like the afterthought at the end. It was more maintaining the data and putting it all together. So, um, you know, it was a very manual process. So the fact that you had a group of people that could keep the charts updated was a good advantage for a place like Fidelity. And uh, when I talked with Bill Doan, who ran the Fidelity team in the 1970s, he said they used to keep it behind a lock and key because it was this secretive room where only the top managers could go in and have the, uh, you know, the honor of going in and getting the wisdom from the technical research department, which I thought was was absolutely fantastic. Um, so it, 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 it's been at Fidelity for uh, for many, many years and it's evolved over time. It's grown uh, and now it has a pretty big footprint at the uh, at the home office in, uh, in Boston. But it's a yeah, it's a really, really cool space with great history. Wow. I, di I didn't know it had been around for that long, yeah. but I mean, it, it really does sound like the, the mecca of charts. Right. <laughs> um, so I, I got to venture to Boston sometime and see it with my own eyes. Right. Yeah. Make it happen at some point. Yeah, but so David, one thing I love about your work is your emphasis on behavioral psychology. And you have this concept that you've talked about called market awareness, and I really like it. So I, I think um, if, if you could just explain that a little more. Yeah, so a lot of, uh, you know, my, my sort of focus over my career has very quickly focused on the behavioral aspects of investing. I studied uh, music and psychology as an undergraduate so when I learned there was a toolkit that allowed you to focus on what investors were thinking and and why they made decisions, often bad decisions with their money, was really interesting to me. So what I love about technical analysis is the fact that it represents investor behavior, which I truly believe. I, I feel like fear and greed are manifested in prices. And if you want to know if people are excited or nervous or desperate or fanatical the price will tell you, and we've seen that with stocks, we've seen that with cryptocurrencies, with all sorts of bubble phases and crashes, and then in little smaller versions of that every trading day, I would, I would argue. So market awareness for me is understanding that you have challenges to your own decision making. There are tools you need to uh, apply to make sure you minimize behavioral biases in your own decisions. But it's also understanding the forest for the trees and understanding the big picture and, and understanding what's working and what's not around the markets. And I, I would argue, as you probably know, charts are, are probably the best way of getting a read on the market dynamics and understanding where the opportunities might be. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think, you know, so many people think of technical analysis and their mind instantly goes to charts. But to me, it's, it's so much more broader than that. And it really is the study of the behavior of market participants. Um, so let me ask you about behavioral biases. Are there any behavioral biases that you've been finding yourself thinking or talking about a lot lately? So many. Um, <laughs> where to start? I mean, there, the, the two most common that I often see are, uh, are confirmation bias and uh, the endowment effect or the endowment bias. And I'll, I'll hit each of those quickly. Confirmation bias is by far the most prevalent. And it is you know, what we should do with decisions is gather a bunch of information, look at the weight of that evidence, and then make a decision. But what we usually do is completely reverse that. So we start with our decision. I'm bullish on Bitcoin. I'm bearish on stocks, whatever it is. And then we try to gather evidence mainly to make ourselves feel better about that decision we've already made. So all we're doing is confirming a decision we've already sort of committed to. So what you want to do and what I try to do is start every day, start every chart review with a clean slate, right? Wipe it clean, 
Just look at the evidence. What are the charts telling me about the conditions right now? And then look at your positioning or look at your, your, your recommendations or your calls. Are they in line with what you're seeing? And if they are, you're good. And if not, you need to change something. So confirmation bias is a, is a really good one and a tough one. And I think the rise in social media with a lot of really cool outcomes, you know, leveling the play, playing field, giving a lot of people access to a lot of really knowledgeable market participants, that's all good. But social media is an echo chamber for confirmation bias. It, it makes it worse. It doesn't make it better. So you really have to go out of your way to break away from your own line of thinking. Um, the other one I would say is the endowment effect, which is basically when you own something, you are hesitant to get rid of it because of an emotional attachment to that thing is how I would gen generally summarize it. So you own Home Depot in your portfolio. It's been a great stock for you for a long time. It starts going down. And instead of selling it, which the evidence clearly tells you you should do, you hold on to it because that's your baby. That's your Home Depot. It's your great. It's one of your best names. You can't get rid of it. It's going to work. And all of a sudden you have hope as your investment philosophy instead of looking at the evidence. So both of those things, confirmation bias and endowment bias, along with a lot of the other biases, I would argue if you use technical analysis correctly, it helps minimize those in a great way, right? The charts will tell you when Alphabet is in an uptrend in 2021 and then very much no longer in an uptrend in 2022. The charts made that very clear well before it's down 10, 20, 30%. So uh Final conclusion, look at charts, Patrick. <laughs> I, You know, I actually wasn't expecting you to say those two, uh, confirmation bias and the endowment effect. One I've been hearing a lot is, is or thinking about a lot is, is recency bias because, you know, how many 2008 analogs have we seen? Or um, and, and on the bullish side, too, I think, you know, as we've been looking for a bottom, it, people are looking for this, like, kind of sharp recovery. Um, it, they're looking for the bottom to be more like an event. Do you, do you, uh, would you agree with that? A hundred percent. And I and I think the challenge with things like recency bias, any of the other ones that we mentioned, though, when you're in the markets longer, I think one of the benefits of experience are you find ways to manage those biases or manage around them or manage through them, right? So the most successful investors I've worked with, um, you know, money managers have had incredible runs. They are very aware of what they're good at, and they're very aware of what they're not good at. And they recognize when they have weaknesses, like a recency bias or something, and they surround themselves with people and resources and tools to help minimize those things. What's happened in the last couple of years is you've had a huge influx of new investors that don't have the experience of being having gone through bear cycles and bull cycles, really knowing what a bear market has been like, really knowing what a bull market is like what individual stocks tend to do, what diff, you know, what happens when rates are going up, which we haven't seen a lot uh, in the last couple of decades. So I, I think um, the challenge for a lot of newer investors is they are very vulnerable to uh, to behavioral biases like the recency effect and others. And, and again, it's just another argument to disconnect from what you think could happen or should happen, focus on what is happening. And again, the charts and, and price primarily can tell you that. Yeah, so let's avoid confirmation bias and, and take away to the evidence approach here. But I want to talk about the S&P 500. So let's entertain both sides, right? Let's, let's look at some of the bullish evidence and some of the bearish evidence. And we'll let our viewers kind of uh, weigh the evidence themselves and, and see what they think matters more. Um, you know, I actually saw a great meme earlier this week. It, it, was, uh, it was a picture of a bear with bullhorns. And it just said the current market environment. I'll try to find a picture of it, but I thought it was actually a pretty good way to, to describe where we're at right now. Um, so what are, what are some of the bearish de developments um, or indicators that, that, you know, that are front of mind for you right now? Yeah. And, I, and, and honestly, Patrick, I love the way you phrase that question. There's a lot of wisdom in how you phrase that, which is, Let's look at the bullish evidence and the bearish evidence and, and think about it. And, and, what, and what's important about that is you think about the different possibilities. I, I don't know what's going to happen to the market tomorrow, and neither do you and neither does anyone else. We can have an educated guess based on our understanding of market history and our analysis of the trends, but something crazy could happen tomorrow that, that is unexpected. But by thinking about those different scenarios, I think you're equipping yourself much better for what, what could happen. So I, I love the way you're thinking about this, to, to be honest with you. I, you know, for me, I've been bearish through most, if not all of 2022. Um, you know, I saw a lot of changes at the end of 2021 that I think took hold very beautifully. And, and the January high 
looking back, there were so many signs of a market top in January high. I think a lot that I probably picked up on very well. Others that as time has gone on and I've looked back and tried to dissect it, it's like, okay, that was such an obvious call. Um, and it's things like, you know, the S&P made a new high, but pretty much nothing else did, right? The NASDAQ, uh, the Russell, momentum, the RSI made a lower high, breadth indicators made a lower high. Like everything was kind of breaking down. It was sort of that classic, very similar to like 2007, where the S&P is going up, but like everything else is kind of rolling over. Um, so the question now, as a, you know, if you're looking at the markets and thinking about the evidence, what really has changed, right? What, what really has improved from that transition? I see the market is going below to really a downward sloping moving average. If you have the 200 day moving average on there, right? We went from above it fairly consistently above the 50 day through most of 2021 to being below the 50 day most of the year. We recently got right above there as a lot of individual stocks did too, but we're rallying up to a descending 200 day moving average, which I was taught is usually not a great position, right? It breaks through the 200 day. That all of a sudden is a very different look because that is a sign of an influx of buying momentum. But while you've seen a lot of rallies, you've seen rallies up to resistance, right? The S&P is rallying, but it's unable to really push through to that next phase. And, and um, I think there are a lot of charts out there like biotechs that come to mind really close to breaking up, but not quite doing it. So my general mentality is assume the trend persists until you see enough evidence to change that picture. And particularly when I'm looking at the major indexes, I'm seeing the conditions that caused 2022, which is the Fed, you know, fighting raging inflation, the dollar being strong. I haven't seen enough to say that those are reversing to the point that I would be 100% bullish thinking uh, thinking an upside from here. That's the bearish argument as I would see it. Yeah. And so, and so what about the bull case? Is, are there any maybe indicators that you're watching to kind of confirm a, a new bull phase? Yeah, so I was going to say that. So there, there are plenty of things that have gotten better, right? And I would say breadth is probably one of the first things I would think about, right? Breadth, I, I would argue breadth conditions are not euphoric, right? They're, they're on the long term. I think they still have a lot more to prove. But particularly coming out of the October lows, you've seen a big upswing in momentum, right? All of the advanced decline lines are above their 50-day moving averages. That's meaningful. Um, you know, they're they're all kind of rolling higher. Small caps are outperforming. That usually is an encouraging sign, although. Last couple of years hasn't been great for that because 2021 was so much led by the mega caps that small caps didn't have a great year uh, in that bull market phase. But you're certainly seeing an improvement there. Um, and a lot of individual stocks. And I think that is one of the takeaways I've had from 2022. If your portfolio consisted of the XOP and other energy stocks, you've had an exceptionally good year, right? So the market is going down is basically saying our growth oriented benchmarks are going down, which is most likely going to happen when inflation is a problem and rates are going up. If you feel that inflation is starting to dissipate, which maybe we're seeing the beginnings of that, if you see the light at the end of the tunnel for the Fed, which it seems like we're starting to do, those are all bullish developments for growth stocks. And I think that's what allows the benchmarks to improve. So there, there are certainly, I, I, I don't, I certainly see an opportunity for the S&P to be meaningfully higher a year from now. My concern is it's not a straight line from point A to point B, and that's why I would be hesitant to be crazy bullish. But I think there's plenty of things that are working out there and plenty of individual stocks that are working. That's encouraging. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up kind of the improvement in breadth because you know, one of my favorite breadth indicators I actually got from you years ago, and you know, it's one of the more basic ones, but it's uh, the percent of stocks above the 200 day moving average. And I was actually checking it earlier and I'm pretty sure it's back above uh, 50% now. I think somewhere near 55%. Um, I'm not sure where it's gonna be at the close today, but do you have kind of a threshold that you like to watch? Is, is 50% the line or 40%? Yeah, so uh, so I, I track that every day and I have a big horizontal line right at the 50% level. And is it a perfect binary bullish or bearish if it crosses that? Of course not. But in general, you will find that in bull market phases, over half of the S&P names are above their 200. That's just by definition, it's it's hard for the S&P to have a meaningful gain without that being the case. And the same same thing on the, on the other side, in a downtrend, in an established downtrend, it remains below 50%. It's been below 50% for most of this year. It just in the last couple of weeks coming off the October low, got back above 50%. Yeah, it's sort of in the mid 50s. Um, the percent above their 50 day was down to maybe single digits. 
uh, six weeks ago, and now it's up to 80, 85%. So it's certainly been an aggressive swing off of the lows and not just a small number of stocks improving, it's everything kind of rallying. Um, so certainly with breadth conditions, the bullish percent index, which uses point and figure charts as a similar methodology to look for strength uh, using that, uh, also in, uh, in sort of a confirmed bull uh, case right now. Yeah, could you elaborate on that one a little more? Because I, I'm not actually too familiar with that one. I, I know it's um, measuring what the number or percent of stocks that are on a point and figure breakout uh, signal, right? So here, here's your history lesson on point and figure charting. Point and figure charting, um, just to, to digress a moment, point and figure charting, a really classic uh, uh, tool for charting and, and really predates computerization. It was really designed so that a floor trader could literally look at the prices, update the chart with X's and O's. And, and I spent time on the floors of the Chicago exchanges before they all you know kind of closed down and went electronic. But guys would still go to the Bloomberg terminal, whatever it was every morning and update the point figure charts and have it on a little note card um, with pivot points and other things that they could use in the middle of the floor. Um, so it, it, it really was designed for simplicity and to allow people to check uh, track trends. Now there's a guy, Abe Cohen, who had a firm called Chartcraft who really popularized point figure charting in, in, uh, in this area of the world and uh, came up with this idea of a bullish percent index, which was turning those point and figure charts into a breadth indicator. So when you look at a point and figure chart, it's a column of X's if it's in an uptrend, a column of O's if it's in a downtrend, and you have basic buy and sell signals. When a column of X's makes a new high, that's a buy signal. When a column of O's makes a new low, that's a sell signal, very simple. So this indicator, this series of indicators called the bullish percent index tells you for a universe like the S&P, what percent of those stocks in the universe are, uh, have most recently had a buy signal. And so the indicator currently is just above 70%, which means over seven out of 10 S&P names, the most recent signal has been a buy signal. And that's up from about 10% at the October low. So 60% of the S&P members have had a valid buy signal from their point figure chart over the last four weeks. That's a big number. Um, the challenge that you have with that indicator now is if you look back in 2022, when it's gone above 70%, which is called a bull confirmed indicator, meaning most of the of the charts in that universe are on a buy. When it comes back below 70%, that is lined up really well with all the major tops in 2022. So you saw it right at the new year in January. You saw it in April. You saw it at the August peak as well. We're really close. It could, depending on what happens on Friday, maybe going into the next week, you could have that situation where it comes down. So again, this is where I see we're really at a decision point in the markets, right? If this continues the pattern we've seen in 2022. We're near upside exhaustion in a bear market rally. But if this indicator could remain above 70%, if the percent of stocks above their 200-day remains above 50%, all of a sudden this is something different. It tells you it's more of a change of character, a new market environment going into year end. That could be super bullish. Yeah, I mean, even just looking at the chart, you you see that you know when it is in those bull phases, it kind of just stays above seventy percent for a while. So you know, if we could get that going, that's probably something you'd want to see from the bull side, right? It's exactly right. And just look back at two thousand twenty-one. You saw a number of periods where it would stay above there, and that just meant strong upside momentum just continuing, which which could happen for sure. Yeah. So I want to move on to the dollar. You know, you mentioned it was one of the big headwinds for stocks this year. And, you know, we've definitely seen cracks in the uptrend. I mean, last week was the worst week for it in over a decade. Uh, but if it's finding some support. And, you know, a lot of people, I think, are quick to, to say this, uh, this uptrend gonna, is, is over. But, uh, you know, it's still above the 200-day moving average. Found some support there this week. And, you know, I have a 40-week moving average, but that's kind of the same thing. Um, so what do you think of the dollar index here? Do you, do you, are you ready to call that trend over? Or? I'm not. And I, and I think in 2022, I, I've described the dollar as the wrecking ball for risk assets, right? If you, if you look back at the overall trends, but particularly on specific days and even a lot of particular weeks, you'll see the dollar up and literally everything else down. Stocks, bonds, cryptos. It's like the dollar's working and nothing else is. And again, that's sort of related to this whole inflationary environment that we have. And it's certainly impacted not just risk assets, but non-U.S. stocks. I mean, how? why would you go outside the U.S. when the dollar is so strong? I would argue you probably shouldn't, even though, you know, areas like India, which I know you, you've looked at, and breaking to new all-time highs. I mean, exceptionally strong charts of the nifty and a lot of individual names that are strong. But 
as a U.S.-based investor, you're giving pretty much all those gains back because of the currency conversion. So it doesn't make a ton of sense. The dollar pulling back in the last couple of weeks is a very different feel. And if that would continue, I think that has profound impact on the ability of uh, risk assets to improve. Certainly things like gold, which have been an absolute dog in 2022 because of the strong dollar. The dollar weakens. That gives an opportunity for that trade, which has not been a great opportunity yet, but certainly could. But the question is if, right? And I think what you're showing is that the dollar has pulled back to its 200-day moving average, just like the S&P is rallying up to its own 200-day moving average. So there is a scenario where the S&P goes right through its 200-day, playing on the seasonal strength going through year end. I would assume that that most likely relates to the dollar continuing to weaken, probably rates not going significantly higher, but more stabilizing uh, as we transition into 2023. And that would be the the very bullish scenario that could play out. But for me, it's not about what could happen. It's about what is happening. So again, a market rallying to a descending 200-day moving average is just like the dollar weakening to an ascending 200-day moving average. If it breaks that and you show that there's follow-through, then I will start changing it. And you're sacrificing the beginning of the move for the stability of waiting for confirmation. I think that's what I'm happy doing at this point. So we're close. I like it. Uh, so you put out a note on gold last week. Uh, it, it was called, I think, the bull case for gold. Is that right? Um, and, you know, I've kind of been hating on gold all year. It hasn't lived up to its reputation as an inflation hedge and didn't participate when commodities were taking off earlier in the year. Uh, but you put a, pointed something out in that note that was kind of interesting. Uh, you, you pointed out that it, gold was outperforming the S&P 500 by about 11%, so maybe it is holding up a little better uh, than I thought in terms of being an inflation hedge. Um, but wh what are your thoughts on gold here and what are the levels you're watching? What's so funny is if you would have told me before 2022 that the, the equity markets would be struggling mightily, they'd be in a confirmed cyclical bear market and that inflation was the main reason, I would say 10 times out of 10 buy gold because that is the, all, I mean, that is the obvious layup playbook. And as you said, it's been absolutely not 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 a great play on an absolute basis, right? It hasn't gained in the way that you would normally expect. And again, the, the reason is because the dollar's been so strong and basically the dollar's the denominator in gold, right? And so when when uh, when the dollar's uh, too strong, it's just not, it's gonna eat away at all the, all the potential upside there. Having said that, one, one of the things that I was looking at is just year-to-date returns, looking at returns over different time periods. While gold is not a fabulous chart on an absolute basis in 2022, Everything's been struggling. Most things are been, have been down, right? Unless you're in like a short bond fund or like short stocks or something, it's been a tough year, most likely. Or if you're in energy, so there's a, a small group of things that have outperformed the S and P pretty consistently. Gold's one of those, and being up by you know 1,100 basis points in the year, I'd probably be pretty happy with that if I was running institutional money at the uh, at the moment. What's happening with gold is on a long term, you're sort of bouncing off long term support levels, right? So we're at the lower end of the range that we've been in for the last couple of years, right? We're sort of back down to the 2020 lows. Uh, and I think that's an interesting time to be to be paying attention to it. On a short-term basis, right? Gold has tried to bounce a number of times, but just in the last month, actually starting to rotate higher. And again, the dollar weakening gives room for, for gold to sort of rotate, uh, rotate to the upside. Um, so I think this could be one of those times, and I've said it before, it's not always right, but boy, I feel like gold is actually setting up pretty well. Charts like Newmont and other gold miners actually looking constructive after looking very unconstructive or non-constructive uh, for most of this year. So I think there's upside to be had here. Yeah, we, I mean, we had that little fail breakdown under that 1675-ish level that had been support for the last uh, year or two before that. Uh, so, so definitely a little bit better footing, but I think it's interesting. I mean, it, the chart has looked kind of interesting from a long-term perspective for like two years now, right? You have that kind of like base on base action. Hasn't, it didn't really totally break down. So, uh, you know, it's breaking hearts, but it's, it's, it hasn't totally broken down yet. <laughs> Agreed. So let's move on to uh, digital gold, Bitcoin, if you will. Obviously getting a lot of attention lately with the whole FTX blow up and all that. And I don't want to get into that too much, um, but I think Bitcoin is fascinating from a behavioral market psychology point of view. I mean, I, I don't think it will ever have a market or, or an asset that is so purely just driven by uh, 
emotion, and it's also just so in the public, you know. So things like magazine indicators, or you know, the the stadium naming rights indicator that that has been being talked about or brought up a little bit more lately, you know, those things. Um, you know, you could you could use Bitcoin in a behavioral finance textbook for almost every concept that there is out there, right? Yeah. Oh, totally. And and I, and, and to be honest with you, as as unique as cryptocurrencies are, and they are, and blockchain technology undoubtedly is transformative. And I think, you know, my, our kids' kids will be using blockchain, it'll be an integral part of things that they do, uh, no doubt about it. The question has not been about the technology, it's been more about the trading vehicles, right? And I think that's where there's been a disconnection between a fascinating new technology with a lot of promise and a very speculative set of trading instruments that are unregulated and untested, right? And and that's the that's the reality. Um, you know, it, it, in some ways, this is new. We're charting new territory, pun intended. But in other ways, this is a, yet another bubble and bust phase. Which we, I mean, I remember reading about the tulip bubble and the South Sea bubble and the tech bubble, which I sort of lived through in the early part of my career. Uh, the housing bubble bubble in in bonds which arguably has been uh you know has 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 evolved i mean i i think the characteristics that you've seen here are very classic in terms of the steps that have been taken uh in a bubble phase and particularly when you look at the sentiment going into the highs right in 2021 at the beginning of this year i, I mean people talking about outrageous you know high uh high high uh objectives for things like bitcoin and ether and why they while they eventually might be uh you know proven accurate certainly not feeling so right now right and you've seen a, a big unwind from that uh from that essentially pure uh pure speculation um and and all along the way again looking back it seems very clear in the heat of a bubble it is really hard to see the signs of a bubble it's way more i would say it's it's crystal clear in the rearview mirror looking back how obvious does it seem that things were overextended and that it was buying hopes and dreams and not really stability in a new asset class um, so again, I when in doubt, follow price, and price has uh, undoubtedly been down here. Yeah, I, I I think you know obviously hindsight is twenty twenty, but there if you're a technician or a behavioral person like yourself, there were plenty of warning signs as you mentioned towards the peak. You know, you had politicians demanding for their salaries in in Bitcoin. I mean, things that you don't normally see. Uh, when something's breaking out like that and, you know, that much public involvement, you know, you, you couldn't go through an airport without seeing a grayscale ad or, um, you know, something for Gemini or FTX. Uh, you couldn't turn on ESPN without seeing FTX on someone's uniform or something. Um, so there were plenty of, of warning signs. But at this point, um, you know, sentiment has shifted to, to being totally despondent. Um, so how do you think about that, too? And, and how about these magazine cover indicators uh, that we got this week? I mean, I woke up and saw this Economist one. You, you got asteroids heading towards the Earth. I mean. <laughs> so what's interesting, I would say that part of the technical toolkit, and really when you think about sentiment and contrarian sentiment, a lot of that is meant to be more of a leading indicator, right? Indicate, you know, recognizing when things are getting overheated or overextended. And you're right. I think we saw a lot of a lot of signs going into the beginning of this year. The Super Bowl ads were maybe one of my favorite ones. The bull in Miami, you didn't mention that was oh, yeah. a great one in, in the spring. Um, you know, these were all signs that things were getting overheated. I don't blame people for getting caught up and not recognizing the euphoria as it's happening. Where I have a problem is when people don't recognize when the euphoria has transitioned. And I think another part of the technical toolkit, which I think is very important, is recognizing trend changes, right? recognizing inflection points. And I find when Bitcoin started coming down, you still heard a lot of people talking about, no, nope, buy the dips, this is an, and that's when I started to get concerned of, okay, this could actually get a lot worse if this is how excited people still are when there are clear signs of distribution. And for me, you know, I think part of technical analysis is, is anticipating a, a turn, but you better have a way of recognizing when a turn has happened. And I would say with Bitcoin, with Ether, there were clear signs before November of 2022 that things were getting worse. So shame on you if you're writing it down, right? I mean, I think there are clear signs that that happens. So now I think we're in sort of that leading phase of a bottom, right? A bottoming phase, right? We're getting uh, in extreme negative sentiment. We're getting, you know, the whole FTX debacle and this expectation you know, are all crypto exchanges 
you know, just going to go under. We, highly unlikely, right? There's there's certainly some, there are going to be bad actors and there's going to be some stability. And this sort of shakes out to a smaller group of well, more established, maybe better regulated things. That is how cryptocurrencies can sort of get their next, uh, their next like higher. The promise of cryptocurrencies were, um, as far as I've, I've, I've thought of it, has been the institutional buy-in, right? My parents, the average investor, think that it's worth doing it. They have trading vehicles and not just GBTC, but better, more liquid ETFs that they could actually access those markets and not set up a Coinbase account or something like that. We're not quite there yet. Those are the things I think systemically that could change things and get them better. From a technical perspective, it needs to stop going down. And that's the problem <laughs> I have with it, right? Is that, I mean, Bitcoin is in a downtrend. Ether is in a downtrend. And I and and I would say if your runway is long enough, I, full disclosure, I own Bitcoin and Ether um, for a very long term in a retirement account, because I think the long term process by the time I retire, I think that's going to be a great bet. As a tactical bet, I'm not seeing anything that makes me excited about the chart from a technical perspective, but be looking for signs of downside exhaustion to confirm the negativity we've seen in some of those magazine covers that you shared. I think those are great. Yeah, I mean, for me, as, as long as it's below those prior cycle highs, I mean, it's got to repair that first. But, you know, if we did, if that did happen and, you know, some of these things we're seeing with sentiment, I think that's encouraging. So maybe we are kind of I like what you, how you described it as part of the bottoming process, and maybe we're getting closer to that phase of it. And, and for me, Bitcoin 20,000 is sort of the level I'm looking at. Big round numbers have actually been pretty meaningful for Bitcoin. If you draw horizontal lines at every 10,000, you'll find a lot of the major turns have happened right around there. So Bitcoin, get, I have an alert set on stock charts for Bitcoin over 20,000. I will review it at that time once again. <laughs> yeah. And hey, it's uh, I, I think it's also... Uh, pretty interesting that you're seeing the laser eyes disappear. You know, I think Tom Brady took his laser eyes off this week. So, well, David, we got to wrap it up now. But uh, before I let you go, where can our viewers find more of your stuff? Hey, thanks so much, Patrick. This is fun. This is a really cool conversation. You do a great job with the show. I, I wish you well, and I, I hope you keep it up because this has been this has been fun to watch some of your other conversations too. Um, so I'm at stockcharts.com. I host the Closing Bell show called The Final Bar every weekday. You can see it live on our website or on YouTube and our on-demand platform after that. My own site is called marketmisbehavior.com, uh, really recognizing the fact that we often just misbehave with our assets and trying to come up with ways to minimize that. Uh, I have a YouTube channel and uh, on social media as well. So look forward to people following me there. Awesome. Well, David, thank you so much for, for coming on today. Always a pleasure talking to you, and I hope you have a great weekend. Thanks, Patrick. You too. I'll see you. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoy the show, be sure to click like and subscribe. We're off next week for Thanksgiving, but have a great holiday. Thanks.